Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So, I think it's been about a year now, maybe a year and a half ago. I began to show you guys my Journey to the Overland Encounter cards. And if you're not familiar with Journey to the Overland, it's a solo tabletop role-playing game. Uh, where you have a character and you move him across this map, which is the Overland. And he will have certain adventures now. The adventures are not tied to the grid numbers like you would see in a lot of systems. Instead, what we do in Journey to the Overland is the adventures are tied to encounters that you will have on the map. And uh, you will pull a card if you have an encounter. So now the cards look like this. So if you had this encounter, that would mean you met this person somewhere in your travels whose name is the maker of many things. At least that's what he's known as. Uh, he is one hex away from you, which uh, is not the same as adjacent. So if you're here, one hex away would be there. Adjacent would be here. Uh, he has 50 gold pieces on him. He's a level one character. Those are mostly important if there's a conflict and you want to gain experience points and gain gold. Or you can gain their possessions, like he has a hammer. But the reason I'm doing this video is I'm, I'm continuing a series I started, like I said, about a year ago, where I was trying to find miniatures to match the characters. So when you encounter them on the map, you can put your figure down or your miniature down, and then you resolve the encounter. So the last time we were here, I went through, whoa, I want to say I maybe went through maybe 50 cards. Uh, so... I'm not going to do those again. That video is, is in my playlist, my Journey to the Overland playlist. So if you want to see where I'm picking up from. There may be a few I do again because I've kind of changed the miniatures as, I'm, as my collection grows or shrinks. Uh, I will swap out miniatures for the ones that I picked earlier because I think one is a little better. But other than that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the cards. I will tell you a little bit about the character or the encounter. And uh, I will tell you why I picked the miniature. Now, obviously, if you own the game or you're thinking of getting the game and you're worried about spoilers, then you might not want to look at this video. But in all likelihood, in all honesty, I mean, there's no spoilers. The cards are pulled at random. It's not. They're not tied to any specific scenario, so... You're going to see all the cards eventually if you play the game. So let's just see. Uh, let's get started. Okay, so I'm not going to do these in any specific order. I am going to just grab one and open it because I've already matched them up. And then we will talk about it. Uh, now, I will give you a list of the ones I did just in case uh, anybody is keeping track for their own collection and you... You want to know if I've already picked a miniature for a card. So the list of the ones I did was the Young Barbarian, the Winged Gargoyle, Traveling Merchant, the Wizard, the Vikings, the Cultists, the Samurai, the Fugitives, the Thief, the Lady Thief, the Elves, Nebular Cain, the Beastman, or Beastman, Sergeant at Arms, the Wraith, the Fallen Asteroid, Fire Elemental, Engineer, Dwarf, Soothsayer, Gladiator, Dwarf Doctor, Virgin Queen, Veteran Crusader, Weather Lord, Warrior of the Undead, Unemployed Executioner, Elven Host, Giant Rats, Wolves, Son of Samson, Goliath, Young David, Goblin Horde, Winged Guardian, Elf Priest, Slaughterhouse of Bamelon, Warrior Chief, Trolls, Executioner, Wandering Jedi, Taskmaster, The Message Center, and Finn McCummel. So those are all the cards I did. I, I think there's a few that are repeated uh, because I swapped them out. So... Let's just start with this one here, and uh, we will discuss it. So the title of this card is Slaughterhouse of Bamelon. And basically, this is an encounter where you run into a guy sort of like uh, the hills have eyes uh, to put you in that kind of mode. Uh, and uh, your party will have to deal with him because he is not a very nice character. And so this is the miniature I got. Which I think is kind of a good representation, even with the yellow hair. Looks like he, he is not wearing his overalls and he's put on some weight. But uh, I just think that's a good miniature. I'm not sure how much you really interact with him in the scenario. 
Meaning, I'm not sure if you would actually be putting a miniature out for an encounter or a battle. But I just like to have miniatures for them, uh, just for my own reference. Okay, the next card we got is this one called A Politician. And I kind of had a little trouble with this guy because I don't really have any, or at least I don't have many, uh, just kind of townsfolk characters, well-dressed. I usually have something like this. So he could be a politician. Maybe he could be a, a wizard or a caster. Uh, but I decided to go with this guy. He kind of looks like a politician. The card says he has a short sword. So there's one, and the number present is one, uh, and he's adjacent to you. I may swap this out, I mean, later on if I can locate a better figure in my collection, but uh, I just wanted to kind of show you guys what, uh, you know, what I picked for that. Now this card is called the Scout, and basically it's an individual who... Not sure if he's working for the king or if he works on his own. You know, it says he has a special ability to travel without checking for getting lost and has a decreased chance of having an encounter. So this guy is very important if you're trying to get a message to somebody or get something delivered and you don't want the person to be waylaid by getting lost or uh, having an encounter where they get attacked. So it's a good NPC. This is the one I chose to be the scout. And I think that's I think that's pretty close. Uh, I don't know. I think this figure this is a metal figure. I think it's from Reaper, like their Dreadmere collection. So, but no, I think I, I I think I like that. Okay, the next figure is called the Runaway Slave, and this was a card I debated on whether using a kind of African uh, colored character. But if you think about slavery in the medieval times or even the ancient periods, it really wasn't based out of Africa, meaning they really didn't make slaves out of people because of the color of their skin. If you got conquered or your kingdom was conquered, you, you usually became slaves. A Spartacus was a slave. So that was kind of what I was going for, kind of the Roman concept of a slave. And this is the figure I came up with. Now, this is actually, I think, from Mythic Battles. Is it Atlas or one of those guys? But uh, I just thought he kind of looked like a slave. Like maybe he's carrying this huge boulder to clear away a construction project or somewhere. They put him to work. So at some point, he will run away, and you may encounter him and then see what you are going to do, whether you're going to help him or, I guess, turn him back in. Okay, and so this card is called the Spring Dragon, and basically it's supposed to be a smaller version of a dragon. There is a, the main dragon in the game that you can fight or try to fight is called the Dragon Valron, and so this is a Spring Dragon. Now, if you look up the information on Archival, where I put more information on my cards, there's only ever really been four dragons known of in the Overland. Uh, two of them were the two original dragons who were created by these uh, these entities called the Guardians. And then there was another dragon, uh, who I believe his name was Val Rudd, who was the, believed to have been the father of Val Ron, which is the current dragon terrorizing the Overland. But everything else is a form of dragon, sort of like wyverns or whatever. And spring dragons are the same. Either these are attempts for the dragons tried to breed with other animals, and of course they didn't quite make another dragon, or uh, these were creations that never quite became dragons. Uh, to whatever extent, though, there's only ever really been four known dragons in the Overland. Uh, but this is a spring dragon. So in, in thinking about that lore... You know, this is kind of what I came up with. Something maybe like this. So you encounter this thing and, you know, you can see it didn't quite, didn't quite make it into a dragon. But still, it's very powerful. Just to give you a small scale of the power that a real dragon has, this thing has an endurance of 125. Muscle is 92. I mean, usually the max is 100. 
So it's exceeded the maximum endurance. Its blast only do minus 20 damage to skin, minus 30 to armor. But either I will do that or I may go with this. So depending on how many times you pull this card, each time it could be a different spring dragon that you run into. Right? And nobody knows what the spring dragons are. That's just what people call them because they're so small and they're kind of like a new budded leaf or new budding leaf. Okay, so that brings us to the Hidden Assassin. This is actually one of my favorite cards in the game. So basically, when you play the game, some of these NPCs will join you and travel with you and so forth. Well, if you pull this card while you have one of them with you, one of your party members is a hidden assassin. They've been sent to kill you. Why? Who knows? Maybe it has something to do with your background. Uh, and in the second edition of the game, you, you do roll for your background now. So that will a lot of them will give you a motive behind some of the things that are happening. But I thought this figure made a pretty cool figure. I might swap it out. This one has a rope, which is normally called a garret. This one has a sword, two stabbing knives. But uh, I have two assassin cards. So I have this one and the other one I, don't, I didn't have a miniature for for some reason. And this one, which is called the assassin. I think both of them are women. And these were done by my artist, Mark DeVera. So it was kind of his prerogative. And he depicted them as females. So uh, I will probably try to find another one for that. But uh, definitely, you know, this one looks like an assassin, obviously, with the hooded face and weapons. And this is a giant, which is totally out of scale. I mean, if there was a giant that big in the, the land, it would, you know, it would cover over mountains. But, you know, maybe there's some perspective because you can see this guy... Uh, Looks quite tiny. So maybe this is the, the giant looming over the horizon. And as you crest it, he comes into perspective. But either way, I thought for this, I'd use this guy. Now, I have some other giants, obviously, from other miniature games. But they're way too big to, you know, look pretty good on my map. So I figure if I throw this guy down in front of somebody, he definitely looks big enough to be a giant. But it's not so unruly that it, it messes up the map. Because some of these some of these NPCs can't wind up following you or joining you or you may play out of combat on the map. So, you know, when I picked them I wanted to keep that in into uh perspective or in consideration is you know, how would they look on the map. Now as we take a look at the next card, one of the things I'll just say as an aside is when I created Journey to the Overland it was very important to me to create a game where you could use all of your miniatures. And that's what the card system does, which I wouldn't have been able to do if I went with a paragraph book or a paragraph system like Barbarian Prince, which is what this game was inspired by. Now, you have to realize I first did Journey to the Overland and copyrighted it in 1987, which was years before Joseph McCullough did Frostgrave and many other things. Uh, but I will say Journey to the Overland is probably the role-playing version of Frostgrave. So if you like Frostgrave because you can get all your miniatures in there, uh, that's kind of what Journey to the Overland does. And it's through these cards. So just by swapping out the cards or creating new cards, I can create, I can add in any kind of creature. If you created a creature today, I could create a card for it and put it into the game that you might encounter. So here we have a party of three L's. Again, this is art by uh, Mark DeVera. Excellent art. Uh, something you don't see is an elder looking elf, sort of like an Elrond. Two female elves in the background. Now, I could not really find any elves that really fit this type. So I may swap these out later. But for now, I simply chose these three guys. These are some L's. Uh, I don't know. I got them on the Kickstarter. I wanted to say, I want to say Oaf, Oaf Swarm Miniatures or Oakwood Miniatures or something. But they did a line of kind of skinny miniatures. And they did some L's. 
I don't know. I just really like them. They're not quite flat like flats, but they are they are skinny. They have this kind of thin profile. Plus, I like the way that they look like they're out traveling and wandering about. This guy is wearing garb as if he's covering up his ears, which would be kind of appropriate in the overland, depending on where you are going. So I thought these guys would be a good fit. Now, obviously, I think if I could get two females to put with them, you know, that would actually be even better. But they will do for now. So next up is The Thief. And again, this is one of my favorite cards. I love the art by Mark. Uh, and basically, I mean, this is just your run-of-the-mill thief. Looks like he may be a little more experienced than most thieves. Uh, what's his thief skill? 45% thief skill. So no, he's probably new at it. Maybe he was forced into thieving. But uh, we'll take a look at the miniature. And so this is kind of the guy that I chose uh, to represent this thief. So obviously the miniature is all covered and ready to strike. This is him probably surveying before he comes down and pulls his hood up over his head. This miniature has some rope, scabbard, a sword, a pouch, all the items you need to be a good thief. And I've got several miniatures I use for thieves because you could actually encounter more than one thief throughout the game. Not only with this card, but there's a, there's a couple other thief cards. Now this is one I think I showed before, because I think it was on my list, which is Trolls. But I don't remember if I had the miniatures at that time or if they were painted. So I'm gonna briefly show them again. And everybody knows what a troll is. These are from Mantic Games Dungeon Dungeon Saga. So I really like the miniatures, the bases, not so much. I mean, look at the huge square bases. So they really mess up my map as far as putting them out. But I think the miniatures are just so uh, characterful, you know, so kind of unique looking that I decided to go with them. Uh, every time I think of swapping them out, I just come back to them, especially when it's three trolls, which this is probably one of the toughest encounters in the game. If you encounter these guys, your best option is to just run. But, uh, and I think I said that in the last video, but you see how he has this brown club or whatever in his hand. So I thought that was kind of cool where they have the brown stone too. And uh, this guy actually has a club in his left hand. So, yeah, that was the trolls. Okay, and so this is a merchant. Now, merchant is actually a skill your character can acquire, which is very useful if you're trying to make money, become very wealthy. I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I've never played a merchant in the game, and I don't know how many people choose to play one. But uh, in the second edition, I'm thinking of picking that skill up because it is, it is, uh, What's the word I want to think about? It is comprehensive, right? So it, it may I may decide to pay for that. But this is who I picked. Looks like he's offering somebody a robe or a scabbard or a scroll or something. But he's obviously trying to close a deal. So I really like that. And, you know, there's some resemblance in the figure. I just didn't paint his uh, turban red. So merchants. Merchants can be very powerful characters in the game if, if you play one long enough now this is another one uh, a harvester uh, which I've actually encountered them now normally uh, normally um, with harvesters or something like that I mean it would have been hard to find a figure for this, you know, back in the day. But nowadays, there's actually some pretty decent choices. So, this is what I came up with. And I think I got him from, uh, I think I got him from, is this, uh, I want to say, Nozors? I can't see what that says. But, uh... 
Yeah, I like him. Now, there's another one that I have that looks a little bit more uh, docile, shall we say. But uh, I like this guy because he looks like he's raising the torture of asking you, you know, where are you going? You know, why are you trespassing on my land? He could also be a rioter. So, but again, this is one I could swap out later. You know, if I decide I want to go with a more kindly type of harvester. Because I think in that encounter, there's really no combat that occurs. I think they just offer you some work to help him bring in his harvest. And, uh... So unless you're just an evil character attacking innocent people, I mean, there's no reason for him to be, you know, to be in a defensive mode. But who knows? Now, if you're just itching for a fight, this is, this somebody here, he's your huckleberry. This is the Wraith. And I think this guy has some kind of attack where basically regular weapons can't hurt him. Uh says, if your weapon's damage, oh, he destroys your weapon's damage as you attack him. You must spend a round changing weapons or begin fist fighting. Any magical attack does double. My hooded wraith. So you have to make an agility check. The damage is done directly to your endurance and it destroys your weapon. So yeah, you can fight him with regular weapons. But this is a cool wraith from, I think this is from D&D Miniatures. No, it says Reaper. Um, I guess, I think that other one said Reaper too. I couldn't see it with my glasses. Uh, but I like the translucent figure just because of the way the artist did the glow. So I think that came out pretty cool. Next up is an engineer who you encounter. Now, Engineer is a funny category because there's really no skill in the game called Engineer, but there are Engineers. And the only way you can get an Engineer is if you locate an NPC Engineer because it's not a skill you can purchase. And Engineers can be very important depending on what you're trying to do in the game, especially if you're trying to build siege weapons or things like that. And so this is the guy I kind of picked as your Engineer. You know, he's kind of got his spectacles surveying the work taking notes to see if the specifications are accurate. His feet are muddy from getting, you know, having to get into the field and check the work. I like his little beanie hat. So yeah, I do like that. That's one of the things I will say that I tried to do when I did Journey to the Overland was in a lot of role-playing games, you only encounter monsters and creatures and important NPCs and mayors and heroes and what I wanted to do in this game was to allow you to encounter ordinary people just basic NPCs uh, but to add, make the encounters meaningful and make them relevant and I think I was able to do that because I really get that feeling when I play the game that sometimes when I encounter like the harvester you know there's been a lot of times my guy was very broke and running into him, I was very tempted to take that work just to put some money in my pocket. So, and that's kind of the way the game is designed, is to, to really make the basic average person you encounter, you know, kind of be very relevant to your character's story arc. Now, this is a figure that I actually, uh, or a card that I actually showed the last time I did the video. If you look at the first part of this, and this card is called Finn McCummo, who's based on an Irish hero. Uh, and uh, normally you would not encounter this guy. He's very hard to run into. I mean, there's only, I think they said, is it like a 40% chance? And uh, you only encounter him in swamps. But he can be a very powerful ally if he joins you, because obviously... He is a hero. I'm trying to see what kind of, if he has his own skill. Because some NPCs have warrior or fighter skill or something, which I don't see in here. I do know, I think in the second edition, I did make some changes to his car. So that you he would be encountered more often and not just in the swamps. Uh, because I did want to get him in the game. And I think I did give him a skill. 
It was either warrior skill or ranger skill, but I did give him a skill. So, uh, now what I didn't show you the last time was his two lions. He has two lions with him named Caesar and Charlemagne. So first, let's take a look at my Finn McCummel right here. Uh, of course, that may be more of a Scottish kilt he has on, but, you know, maybe he has passed through Scotland. And this is, I think, a zombie side Black Plague figure. Uh, I don't know. if this, I don't think it's the William Wallace one, but maybe it is. But that is my Finn McCummel. And then these are his two lions. Caesar is the male and Charlemagne is the female. So when you encounter him, he will be accompanied by his two lions. Okay, so before we talk about the scout card, I will say this about the lions that are accompanying uh, Finn McCummel. In the first edition of the rules, animals just basically had a stat line, and that was pretty much it. In the second edition, in the animal section, which actually got left out of the first section by mistake, uh, there are actually specific rules for certain animals, and the lion is one of those animals that has a specific set of rules. So if you do encounter him with his lions, you should turn to that part of the rule book and just look up the rules on the lions because they do have a specific set of rules as to you know what they can do, how they react, and things like that. Uh, so these are just some scouts. Now I think these scouts are working for King's Castle. So they're mounted, you know, they're armed, short swords, they have food on them. So typically, if you get to the point in the game where you have your own troops, which is possible, uh, if you're running into the King Scouts, that's not going to be a good thing for you to be walking around the overland with a, an army behind your back because word will get to the king. But these are the two scouts. And I think these are from an old game called X Illus. But I thought they made great scouts because they're, you know, they're obviously soldiers. But they're not mounted on war horses or barded horses. They're on quick, fast horses like you would see with scouts. I mean, even their shields are small and light and their swords and stuff. But they still got a little decent amount of armor and some supplies. So these would be two scouts. Okay, so I'm going to do two more cards and then I'm going to stop it and we'll save the rest for part three. And this card is called the Lady Thief. And as I told you, there's different iterations of thieves in this game because that is actually probably one of the most common professions in the Overland, as in any role-playing game, is a thief. Doesn't take much to start out as a thief. You simply throw on your cloak and go steal something. <laughs> and you're a thief. But this is the Lady Thief. Now, ironically, she is a 55% thief, so she is actually a better thief than the male thief that we saw earlier. So, there you go. For all of you women out there that want equal rights for women, you have an equally, if actually a more experienced and more capable thief. And I like the miniature I picked for her. Let me see if I can dig it out of here. Let's dig out my lady thief. And there we go. Now this one is armed to the hilt, but she her hood, she's wearing a hood, just like her. It's almost the same color. She's got some nice armor on, although this one doesn't say she has armor. Double daggers. Looks like a crossbow. So she's set. This one is set. And this thief might actually join your party. Of course, after she joins you, she might actually rob you. Because that's what thieves do. All right, so we got one more card. Now, this is another one of my favorite cards that took me forever to find some good miniatures for. And these are female Amazons, obviously. Uh, meaning female and Amazon. But there are four of them, which made it so hard because... Now, I would find one good miniature, but I couldn't find any that looked identical to be the Amazons. Uh, and it says here, as soon as you encounter them, they attack. And they're wearing armor. And they have staffs or spears. Uh, 
It says, any women in the party, if you defeat them that you do not kill, would actually join you. So you'd have a chance to add some Amazons to your party. And these are the ones I came up with. Now, these probably look more like jungle women, but these are from, uh, if I can remember it now, Lucid Eye for their Savage World collection. And these are their Amazons from their Savage World collection that I really, I really like. They don't have the armor that you typically associate with Amazons. And I'm working on maybe getting some different set where they do have the armor because the card does say they are armored. But depending on, you know, where you encounter them at, uh, this is how they look. Now, if I get the set with armor, and I don't mean from Lucid Eye, but just from another manufacturer, then I will probably create a separate card for these, the ones without the armor that you encounter. But I'm going to stop it here. We're about 30 minutes. I've got plenty more cards to go. So I will do a third video and I will try to post that in the near future. Or, you know, whenever the time is right. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Take care. God bless.